The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. More to be desired are they than gold, sweeter far than honey in the comb. You may be seated. At the very heart of the Jewish faith is the Torah. Now that word Torah is one that generally gets translated in a flat fashion as the law. And at the heart of the Torah, the law, are the Ten Commandments. Now the Ten Commandments themselves have many names. Decalogue, which is just a way of saying ten words. The thou shalt nots. I heard one people, person even refer to them as the wagging finger of God. For her, they were what she disliked about religion. That anybody, apparently even our creator, would dare to tell us how to live. I'm an American. It's a free country. You're not my boss, as my four-year-old daughter wrongly said to her mother and I one day. <laughs> we assured her we are. I want no constraints on me except me, my conscience, I alone decide what's right. And yet it's funny how that works. My conscience and my evaluation of what's right always conveniently <coughs> bends with my own appetites and desires. And yet much of that desire not to be told uh, anything by anyone else is why we hear Torah and law and and some people just think, you know, yuck, it's a bunch of Old Testament stuff. Some folks actually say that. Sadly, some parishioners have said that over the year. I'm glad I'm a Christian so I don't have to deal with the Old Testament. I'm a New Testament Christian, to which I say I don't know how you throw away two-thirds of the Bible and still be a Christian because what you're throwing away is what Jesus called the Bible. There was no other Bible, and he made very clear that he didn't come to overturn, overturn what had come before him, but to fulfill it. Now, I said that Torah is oftentimes translated flatly as the law. And yet, what it, what it literally means in Hebrew is the finger through which the law flows, which sounds very weird, but it's a directional sort of word. And, and the thought is, if you think about fingers on a bow and the arrow flows through them, the fingers tell the arrow where to go. And thus a Jewish person hears of the law of the God, the, the Torah, and they don't think of it as a horrible burden to be born, but rather as a life that they are being invited to live into. God is not here trying to wag his finger at humanity, but rather to point us, to launch us towards abundant life. Now, it's very important when one thinks of the Ten Commandments to realize that they had a context. And you heard it right at the very beginning of the reading today, if you were listening, the, the context is that these commandments are being given to Hebrew ex-slaves who had just been released from 400 years of slavery. So these people are out there right uh, uh, free from slavery. They don't have any constitution. There's no James Madison, no Alexander Hamilton. No three-branch government with separation of powers. Instead, all they had was this leader Moses, who they were hot and cold to depending upon the time of day and a residence in the middle of nowhere. In other words, on their own, these just redeemed slaves have no way of being anything other than slaves. With the dehumanization and the day-to-day -day survival mode of living, the broken family structures, the cheap life sort of mentality that comes along with slavery. And yet today, in this lesson, they're being assured that they have something more. 
that they have a God who loves them and loves them enough not to simply leave them to their own devices, but rather is intent on forming them as a people, pointing them to a way of fulfillment, launching them like that error to a certain destination. You know, to my mind, the people of Israel are the most poignant example, proof even of God's miraculous intervention in human history as anything that history has ever provided. I say that because their story is not how ex-slave stories go. You want to think about how ex-slave stories go? Go to Haiti. The terrible slave slavery in that place that had torn apart these people, and although they they threw off the slave masters, they still can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again centuries later. Think about the slave story of America, our original sin as a country. Violence yields violence. Violent Treatment yields violent future sins, get passed from generation to generation. The ex- economic exploitation of others becomes just a way of life, and, and you view, therefore, people uh, not as people but as functions. Family structures, once they're broken, are not easily healed. And so the question is, how does Israel so quickly become a people with a purpose, working together at least as good as humans ever pull off, set in a meaningful direction, and knowing who they are so quickly after 400 years of slavery. And their answer would come quickly, and it would be universal. In their minds, it's Torah. It's God-given Torah. They knew, they still know, that to live Torah is to live a life bent in the direction of God, which means to live a life that's bent toward reality. For living a life bent in the direction of the one who created you is the only way to really live a life that is bent toward reality. And so the Torah is this finger that's pointing them towards that future. And yet it's also pointing each and every one of us, if we'll listen, to a question that is fundamental to the human existence. And that question is, who am I? And the Torah answers that. These commandments answer that. I am the one created by a God who loves me. I am one who has been saved from all oppression, who is who is more powerful than all the pharaohs of this world. I am one who is never to live just for the benefit of others, like a slave. I am not an object. I matter. In fact, I matter so much that I'm more valuable than the greatest empire in the world, Egypt. I am more precious than all the riches of this world. My simple dignity as a human being, who am I? I am redeemed from any image of me that would seek to enslave me into being less than who God says I am. So take that, Pharaoh. But because of that redemption, I also am one who is beholden to someone beyond myself. I have a God above me. I am answerable. And thus I'm called to love God above all else because God has loved me above all else. And because I'm one who knows this true and living God, I do not rely on lesser gods. This is what it means when it says, do not put an idol before me. Now we hear that word idol and we think of antiquated, primitive people, worshiping little carvings or things like that. Or maybe you don't even think that you're idol and you think American idol or something and some cheeky Brit being mean to singer wannabes on TV. And yet if you think that idolatry is only that, let me just assure you that idolatry is as abundant right now as it's ever been. And the reason for this is very simple. It's because human beings worship. 
every single human being will worship something. Now, that may sound weird to you because you have an uncle who is an atheist and he tells you he doesn't worship anything, but he's wrong. He does. He just calls it something other than worship. What I mean by that is human beings being creatures by our very nature are are in need of something beyond us. And so we give ourselves over to transcendence of some form or or matter. Now that transcendence may be a cause, it may be our nationalism, it may be an ideology. Anymore we're seeing a lot of idolatry in our politics. But let me assure you that we will give ourselves over to something. And unfortunately, we have PhDs in worshiping the wrong things. Beauty and fame and power and ideology and politics, yes. Money, our career, the opinion of cheeky Brits on television, idols abound. And worshiping the right and wrong things really matter. For there is only one who is worthy of our worship, one who is worthy of that trust, because there's only one who will redeem you from every Pharaoh out there and not become another one. One, only one who really knows you enough as your creator to point you in the direction of being who you really are created to be. So you see how the Torah tells me who I am. The Torah tells me who I am. I am one who is careful, therefore, in how I talk about things beyond me. I know that I'm a creature beholden to a creator. And so I am one who also has the good sense to know what I don't know. That I'm dwarfed by mystery in this world. And that's what it means when it says not to take God's name in vain. This isn't about cussing when you stub your toe. It's not even really about saying gosh or God, even. What the commandment says literally in Hebrew is never use Yahweh's name for emptiness. How do we use God's name for emptiness? What it's saying to us is be careful when you throw around all this God language, which is really dangerous when you're in my profession. But be careful, Eric, when you talk about who God likes, and certainly be careful if you ever presume to say that there's someone who God hates. Be careful what you, when you say what God will do and what God won't do, how God will judge Be careful that your words aren't describing just God as you would have God be. Remember who's God here. God's bigger than you and your words, than me and my words. He's bigger than our emptiness. The vanities of our lives, our smallness. God is not made in our image. We are made in God's who is to be reverenced and not drugged down to our levels. It's how the Torah tells me who I am. The Torah tells me who I am by telling me also that I am one who doesn't live life for living life's sake. It's what it means to keep the Sabbath holy. It means that I take time to realize that life has purpose and meaning. I I step back in order so that I might be there for my family. I take time to, to worship a God deserving of it. I take time to laugh belly laughs with friends and and sing silly songs with my kids. I take time to reflect. Also, as someone who has a staff to take care of, I, I make sure that my employees and those under my care aren't treated as functions. The world doesn't need a new pharaoh. Who am I? I am one who doesn't live life like I'm a hamster on a wheel. Because the first commandment, as it told me, I am worth more than that. That is how Pharaoh treats people. And yet I've been redeemed from Pharaoh. And so work doesn't get to become my new Pharaoh. You see how the commandments redeem the story of human life, how they redeem humanity from the grasp of all the would-be slave masters of the world. 
how they are actually life expanding, how they form proper identity. And in forming a proper identity, in helping us to remember and know who we really are, they then beckon us to treat others as we have been treated by God. And thus we honor our father and our mother. We do not steal. We do not murder. We do not commit adultery. We don't bear false witness, even on Facebook. We don't. We do not covet what we don't have. In other words, we live life mindful of others because God has been mindful to us. And oddly enough, by treating others well, you find yourself. This is what Jesus meant when he said, if you want to lose your life, then try to hold on to it too tight. You want to find your life, give it away. Because the more you live life only for you, the smaller you will become as a person. And the more you live life for others, the bigger that you will become. When I do wedding counseling for especially young couples, you know, all they're thinking about, of course, is you know, the details of the wedding, themselves, what's going to happen in their lives, where are they going to live, what are they going to do, how are they going to put everything together. It, it's all about them, and that's just kind of how it needs to be at that stage of life. But then when I ask them to imagine a married couple that they would love to be in 50 years, and then I say, is that couple that's in your mind's eye, do they live a life only for themselves? And the answer is inevitably no. It's, it's grandparents with, with hearts so big that they, they just include everybody and they are so much about other people that this love that's in their lives spreads around because that's how we have been created. It's the commandment of our life if we're going to have a true life. And so you see, I hope, that these commandments are not heavy burdens, but actually guidelines for freedom. They point the way forward, not in order to re-enslave us to rules, but rather to show us how not to re-enslave ourselves to pointlessness and forgetfulness and selfishness and nothingness and any other false god who is unworthy of us. And this, this is freedom. And this is what God wants most for you, so much so that this is what God commands of you. Abraham Lincoln asked this question to his cabinet. If you call a sheep's tail a leg, how many legs will that sheep have? Everyone said, five. Lincoln replied, no, it's four. Calling a tail a leg won't make it so. Are the truths that are governing your life actually true? Are the things that you bend your life toward worthy of your life? Because calling something that's less than a life a life doesn't make it a life. And so I implore you to take the time to ask, who am I? Whose am I? What will I give my life to? And if the answer to those questions lands you in the vicinity of our Redeemer God, well, then I think that you need to then ask, well, how, therefore, must I live with this God above me and the neighbors that God has placed around me? And if you have the courage to do all that, then try to find the courage to live life according to that law, realizing that when you do so, you're being launched into a life, not of slavery, but actually freedom from it. Amen.